Good morning, St. Austell. As Pete said, my name's Esther, and it's such a privilege to be with you this morning. I'm part of the Free Methodist Church, and I've always lived up north here in Lancashire, being part of various churches, um, but I do love Cornwall. In the last couple of years, I've had the opportunity to come down to Hale and to Helston, and it's been fantastic experiences. And um, I don't miss the six hour car trip this morning to get to speak to you, but I have to admit it would be lovely to come and see you all in person today. So right now, uh, me and my family, we're part of Valley Church in Preston, and we've been here for the last three years. And we were a family of seven, but my husband and one of my sons has already graduated to heaven. And so now we are a family of five. So my four children, I've got three boys and a girl at home, and the eldest is 18 and the youngest is 10. And I have to say, it's a great age for being in lockdown, if you have to all be in the same space at the same time. Um, they've all handled it really well and it did help that I set up a pool in the garden yesterday so we've been having lots of fun with that and I hope you guys are doing okay as well. I love that you're part of a church community if you're watching this you're, you're tuning into church and I don't know how people are managing through lockdown without a community like this where we can gather around and stay connected and encourage each other and uh, build each other up and talk to each other about what's on our minds and it's a real honour that at the moment, church is without walls that we get to connect with each other wherever we are. And I don't think that we've ever seen anything like this. And despite everything that's going on and the difficulties that people are facing, it's also exciting to see that God is using every single situation and circumstance to grow his church and to build his church and to, um, to go to new places that we've never gone before. So this morning, I wanted to bring to you a story which is a bit of an unusual one it's probably quite a famous one as in it's like a Sunday school type story that people even if they haven't been around church or the Bible a lot may have heard of and it's to do with the ten plagues of Egypt so I'll just backtrack a little bit for you uh, in Genesis God called a particular family and he said through you I'm going to do extraordinary things I'm going to change the world through your family there was Abraham and his son Isaac and then Jacob and then Jacob's 12 sons and what happens is God, we see God do extraordinary things throughout Genesis in this family but by the time we get to the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, everything's gone really quiet for a really, really long time because this whole group of people are in slavery. They've grown tremendously. There's loads of them now, but they are trapped in slavery. And so God raises up a guy called Moses and he says, I want you to go to the Pharaoh, to the king of Egypt and tell him to let my people go. And when Moses goes with his brother Aaron, God gives him these miracles to do. And he says, if you're going to perform this miracle, it's going to get their attention. So he does these things. But what happens is um, that Pharaoh has his own little bunch of magic guys. And when they're presented with God's miracles, they have a way of answering this. And we're going to look this morning at one example of this. So, so far in the story, we've had Moses having a staff, uh, a big stick, and he throws that down and turns it into a snake. And then the magicians have come and they've said, yeah, we can do that too. We've seen Moses t put his staff in water and for all the water in Egypt to turn into blood. And we've seen the magic guys say, yeah, we can do that too. And here's the story from Exodus chapter 8, verses 1 to 8. Then the Lord said to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, this is what the Lord says, let my people go so that they may worship me. If you refuse to let them go, I will send a plague of frogs on your whole country. The Nile will teem with frogs. They will come up into your palace and your bedroom and onto your bed, into the houses of your officials and on your people and into your ovens and kneading troughs. The frogs will come up on you and your people and all your officials. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell Aaron, stretch out your hand with your staff over the streams and canals and ponds and make frogs come up on the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt and the frogs came up and covered the land. But the magicians did the same thing by their secret arts. They also made frogs come up on the land of Egypt. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, pray to the Lord to take the frogs away from me and my people and I will let your people go to offer sacrifices to the Lord. So the unusual thing about this story is the big question of 
when Moses is bringing these signs and wonders, which means that things aren't going great for the Egyptians because they don't have clean water to drink or they're overrun with frogs, a lot of which can carry diseases and things into their um, situation, that when Pharaoh turns to his magicians, what do they do about the situation? They create more frogs, more blood, more snakes. And the big question is this, why? Why would they want to add to the problem instead of taking it away? And we see there in verse 8 at the end of that small passage that, Mo that Pharaoh has to go back to Moses and say, please can you remove these frogs? Probably not just the frogs that your God has caused on this land, but also the frogs that my magicians have caused to come upon this land as well. And it's one of those weird stories in the Bible that you can skip over and on your way to something else and miss that moment where you stop and think, what on earth is that about? Why would they just add to the problem? And I think the answer is this, and the more that I look through the Bible, the more that I see it, is that the enemy cannot stop anything that God is doing. The only thing the enemy can do is to replicate what God has already done. So the title for this morning is that creation is greater than imitation. So God is the creator of everything. We see that all the way in the beginning of the Bible that he created the heavens and the earth. Nothing is here apart from God. He is the beginning and the end, the Alpha, the Omega, the source of life and everything else. And we see from other snippets throughout the Bible that what Satan, what the enemy did was he watched God and he looked at God and he said, I want to be like that. And so he rebelled and he took other angels and when God created the earth, the enemy came and he began to um, distract and, and to try and get in the way of what God was doing with the people that he created. So this is an ongoing story all the way through the word of God. But we can see from the end of that story and from other things where, where God talks about it is that the enemy can't actually stop anything that God does. We see in John 10 verses 27 to 29 when Jesus is talking to the crowd around him, he says this to them, my sheep listen to my voice, I know them and they follow me, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. And he repeats it again, my father who has given them to me is greater than all, no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. And this is such good news for us that nothing that the enemy says or does can stop what God has for us. We are children of a good father who has good things for us. And we may go through circumstances in our lives where we don't really understand what's going on, where we feel up and down and all over the place and plans haven't worked out and we feel like good things have been taken from us or things that we've been working towards haven't come to fruition. But we can see from the promises of God that nothing, nothing, nothing stops his plans and his purposes from working out and that he brings good out of every single situation. So the only tool that the enemy has in his hand is to take something that God has already done, something that God has already started or already spoken or already put into being and to twist it just a little bit to give us a, a cheap flimsy imitation of what God has already offered us and to dangle it somewhere over here and say hey this is just the same this is kind of the same as what you could have over there but it's easier it's quicker it's more accessible it requires less of you it's like a poorer shadow of what God has got for you but in the moment we look and we go oh that looks like it's going to fulfill this need inside of me because the enemy is, he says it masquerades, he masquerades as an angel of light. It says this in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 14. He pretends to be and to do what God already is and is already doing, but it's actually not the same. So I'm going to give you some examples this morning of what that can look like in our own lives. How we can walk into stuff not realizing that we're trying to fulfill something that only God can, can, can fulfill in us. So one example of this is the situation that we've seen just a few weeks ago when 
lock, it was before lockdown actually started, but we knew that things were changing. We knew that there was something out there called the coronavirus and that we were going to have to get ready for some changes in our society. Well, what happened if you went to, to walk through a supermarket in mid-March of 2020? You would work, walk down certain aisles, say like the pasta aisle or the tinned bean aisle, and you'd go, where's everything gone? Oh my goodness, what's happening? And there was a sense of panic there, wasn't there? And the ultimate thing, of course, was the toilet paper aisle. That toilet paper everywhere was sold out and everyone was panicking. Now, there were some things that people could understand, like paracetamol, for example, and hand sanitizer, which were actually going to help in, in terms of, you know, if you did catch the virus um, or, to, or to help you prevent catching the virus. But toilet paper was this thing that everybody just went, why? Why toilet paper? That's not going to help the situation at all. But what we were doing as a society in that moment were we, we were all craving safety. We were saying there's something coming, we don't know what it is, we don't know what to do about it, but I need to make sure that I'm going to be okay, that I'm not going to run out of what I need. And safety is something, a gift that God has already given us, he's already promised it to us, he is the origin of safety, he is a safe place to go to. And it's good to be wise with our resources and to think ahead. But I think what the enemy was doing in that time was he was planting that seed in people that said, you need safety. So it was a God-given desire for safety. But the enemy was putting fear into people that said safety comes in stocking up everything that you might need for yourself. Never mind about your neighbor or other people. You get what you need in this situation. So the, the thing that God has created for us, this place of safety, has been imitated by the enemy to say, grab what you can, when you can, and make sure you put yourself first. We can see it in other areas of the way that our mind works when we're talking to people, uh, when it comes to feeling superior. And this is an example of a really good thing that God has put in our lives. He has spoken right from the very beginning when he put humankind on earth. He said, it's your responsibility to take dominion over the earth, to take responsibility for what's around you, to subdue the land. In other words, to, to make sure that you have control over the area around you, to take authority, to work hard, to make life work for you and not the other way around. And we see in the New Testament that God speaks over and over about how we can gain the victory, how we don't need to allow life circumstances to roll over us, but instead we can find victory in every single situation. There's an incredible promise in Deuteronomy 28 verse 13. It says, the Lord will make you the head, not the tail. If you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God that I give you this day and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top and never the bottom. How incredible is that? This is the promise that God has given us to walk in victory. But so often we trade that true victory, that true authority over our circumstances, and we use that same desire in us to be better than, and we twist it so it becomes something really ugly. We twist it so that we can put ourselves all the time in a, like a position of superiority over our fellow humans where we enjoy it when we are right about something and somebody else is wrong, where we enjoy it where we see someone else fail and we go, yeah, I wouldn't have done it that way. Yeah, I've already cracked that. Yeah, I'm better than, than them. And quite often we try to hide it and, and be all polite about it. But let's be honest, even with our own families, we get that inner bit of rejoicing, don't we? When, when someone else is wrong about something and we're right and we know the better way. And it's a real ugly character trait and yet it's taking what God has created for good for, for us to live our best lives here on earth and it's twisting it down to the lowest common denominator just as the enemy would love us to do. To compare and to judge and try and put ourselves above other people which is not what God intended for us at all. Another example of ways that the enemy is taking what God has already given us and trying to repackage it and offer it back to us in a, in a much worse way is the area of rebirth. So most of us recognize whether we're following God or not, whether we know his word or not, we have this just something inside of us that says, I feel like there's supposed to be more. I feel like I am not living life 
in, in the best way. I know that I'm not perfect. I know that I'm far from who I'm supposed to be. And I honestly believe that is something that is crying out in the spirit of all of us. That God has planted really, really deep down a craving for perfection and to be perfect. And it's there because God has given us everything we need in order to become new creations. He wants us to focus on this goal at the end of our lives that one day we will find heaven, everything will be restored, and everything will be back to perfection. And this need inside of us means that we keep focused on God because he is the restorer. He is the creator. He is the one that makes everything as it ought to be. But what the enemy does is he takes that message of rebirth and recreation and he twists it. And so every day we are bombarded with these messages through advertising, um, social media, magazines are completely built on this. And it's the message that says, be a better you. You need to change yourself. You need to improve yourself in order to be better. You will find happiness if you just buy this product or wear these clothes or change something else about your lifestyle, which means that you're going to hand over loads of money to a company that can help you to do that. And it's the message that we hear through all sorts of, of the different stories that we're fed every day through and um, the stuff that we watch and the stuff that we read and the stuff we listen to. It says if you're not happy, maybe it's to do with your relationships. Why don't you try different kind of relationships? Why don't you change something about your identity? We can have surgery now where we can literally change the way that we look, the anatomy of our body. We can become a whole new person through scientific means and all of this is like an, a compulsiveness that we have to rebrand ourselves to try and find the perfect version of who we think we're supposed to be but pastor pete talked about this last week when he talked about the story of david a man who really fell from grace who really fell short of the mark and acknowledged and knew that he'd fallen far from perfection and what did david do is he turned to God and he said in Psalm 51 verse 10, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. We all need rebirth. We all need a chance to wipe the slate clean and start again and become a more perfected version of who we are. And the good news is that's exactly why Jesus came. He came to stand in the gap for us and to represent us, to be the perfect you, the perfect me that we couldn't be. And so that God sees us that way instead. It says in, uh, in John 3 verse 3, it says that um, we need to be born again. It's what Jesus speaks to the disciples about. He speaks to Nicodemus about it and says, you do need to be born again. That desire that you have in you for change, for rebirth, for perfection, is actually a God-given desire. It's not something that you've made up. It says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. So that promise of rebirth is there. We're just looking in the wrong places for it. We are trying to get rid of, of the God-given talents, abilities, and distinctive things that make us exactly who we're supposed to be. We're trying to squash that. And in the meantime, God is saying, no, 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 I've given all of that to you. That is who you are supposed to be. But let me come with my forgiveness. Let me come with my grace. Let me come with my healing and make all of that stuff even better as you walk with me in this rebirth of the best version that you can be while you're here on earth. And I've got something even better promised for you in the next life. But we have to make sure all the time that our view is fixed on Jesus, on God, and not on all these other things that are shouting at us from the world to, to take our attention, to take our energy, and to invest in something that God never meant us to invest in in the first place. Another example of the way that the enemy has taken things and twisted it is in the area of intimacy. We all have a desire to be see, truly seen and truly known, but still truly loved. There is something in us that wants to connect on a really, really deep level with other people. 
And again, the message that we get from Hollywood, from all the best stories have this element to it that says, if you can just find the person, the one, your soulmate, that will be the thing that completes you. If you can do that, it's worth walking away from anything else. It's worth, worth walking away from the relationship that you're in right now. It's worth giving up your identity and your friends to find the one that you can truly be intimate with. And we've seen people turn their whole lives around when they feel like they've found that. And you know, that's the ultimate goal, isn't it, for relationships that we can see. But very often we begin to even compromise on that and we say, you know, if I can't find the one, maybe I could just find our one. If someone is willing to, to be with me, whether it's for a few months or weeks or days or even hours in this hookup culture that we, we have, people would rather trade um, a part of themselves for moments that feel like they are intimate than to not have that at all. And we even, there's another level that we can take it down even further, which is that it's not even us that are engaging in intimacy, but we are happy to sit and to look at a screen and watch other people engage in something that looks like intimacy, but it's actually fake. It's actually them carrying out things that look like intimacy. And there's something inside of us that in that moment connects with it. And it feels like it's fulfilling a need inside of us, but it's actually not. The enemy is lying to us when he puts that kind of stuff in front of us and says, yeah, aim for this. This is what's going to make you feel better. It's like taking what looks like a drink of water and it turns out to be bleach and it poisons us from the inside and it is not God's intention for us. The most truest intimacy we can ever find is with our Father. Our Father who knows us inside out. He knew us before we were born. He knows the thoughts that we think before we're going to think them. He knows the words that are on our tongue before we speak them. If you read through Psalm 139, it is a beautiful, beautiful picture of the, the level to which God knows you and how close he is to you. And it says in, in Luke 12, verses 6 to 7, when Jesus is talking about his father, he says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten by God? Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I can't get my head around that. Like the amount of hairs in my head changes every day by the amount that I find on the floor and in the shower. But God knows the hairs on my head. And there is nothing that I'm ever going to find that can replicate that. And we need to learn that when we slow down, when we take the time to tune into God and to build up layer upon layer of understanding and trust, of just being in his presence, of spending time in his word, the words that he's given to us so that we can know him better and be known better by him. When we spend time investing in that, we find a much truer intimacy than a moment that just makes us feel good and then it's gone again and afterwards we feel worse for having engaged in it. We need to fill our reservoir of intimacy with God so that actually our real life relationships become better and more fulfilling and deeper and purer and lovelier as a result of spending all that time in God's presence. And the final example I want to give this morning, which follows on from intimacy, is that we are all looking for acceptance. We all want to be seen, truly seen for who we are, and for people to still like us as a result of that. So we spend a lot of time, and at the moment, a lot of our relationships are coming through what we can put on a screen towards other people because we're not seeing each other in real life. So from video calls through to Instagram stories or pictures or whatever else we're putting out there, we automatically try and filter ourselves we think okay which bits of me do I not want out there and seen like you can't see the state of the rest of this room at the minute you just see a blank wall you don't know how messy the rest of my room is right now because I'm choosing which part that you can see and this is what we do what what am I going to hide and what am I going to capture and put out there to the world because I want people to like me 
I want people to accept me. And we have this fear that says, if I don't get enough likes, if I don't get enough acceptance, um, whether it's on screen or whether it's in real life, then then who am I? And, and how am I going to uh, get through life without people liking me? And so the enemy makes us do these somersaults and these gymnastics um, inside ourselves. It means that we're constantly trying to shove certain things down and bring things up and put pressure on ourselves to try and earn love and acceptance from people and God spoke to me really powerfully about this when I was a teenager I think I was maybe 15 16 and there was one night I was going out to youth or something like that and I'd been getting ready and then I'd gone out and I came back later and there was a little note um, in my bedroom from my mum and um, it was just a really really simple little note and it said this, she said, um, Esther, as you were getting ready to go out tonight, I looked at you and I just thought, what a beautiful person you are on the inside and on the outside. Now that's all that that note said, but honestly, it absolutely broke me in that moment. And this is the reason why. Like, it is easy to try and make yourself look nice and go out there and present yourself for a couple of hours with people and be the best version of yourself. But very often when we come home, and we relax and we take all that stuff off and we, we take down our defenses and, and we stop thinking about trying to be the best versions of ourselves. That's sometimes where the worst comes out, isn't it? And my mum knew me really, really well. She saw more than what most people saw because I was so desperate to be liked and for people to think well of me. But she saw all the stuff that went on behind that. She saw the way that I reacted to my two brothers, one older, one younger, who used to wind me up. And oh my goodness, they brought stuff out of me that I didn't know was there. There were moments where I could just be a horrible, horrible person. There were times I was tired and grumpy and manipulative. And my mum saw all of that. So that day when she wrote that little note, and put it there it meant so much to me and I felt like it was a like a word from not just from my mom but from my father in heaven as well that said I see everything about you and I still think you're amazing I still accept you I still love you I still think that you are absolutely fantastic and that is the greatest gift that we can get and so if we stop trying to search for that in the ways all the distractions that the enemy is trying to give to us and we lay that stuff down for a while and we say no I'm going to spend time with my father I'm going to soak up his words to me I'm going to sit in his presence and hear his heart for me and I'm going to approach him because Jesus has made a way for that to happen and I'm going to let him be the source of my acceptance my intimacy my love my confidence if we can do that then we are aiming for the highest possible gift for what God has created for us not what the enemy has imitated for us in order to pull us further away from our father so as we wrap it up this morning I just want to remind you of this so Pharaoh all the way back to the beginning of the story Pharaoh wanted the people of Israel to stay in slavery because then he could use them for whatever he wanted to use them for if he could convince people that the same thing that God was presenting to them was the already available right where they were just in a slightly different package then they would stay trapped and helpless and they wouldn't see the need to go anywhere else to search for something else so because they'd lived like that for so long they actually couldn't imagine anything better but God was offering them genuine freedom he wanted them to see the fulfillment of the promise that had been spoken over them generations before they were even born and the same is true for you right now God has so much for you but where in your life are you accepting imitations of it the quick easy answers instead of the real thing that God has for you and so this morning we're going to pray and I challenge you to identify where in your life have you been accepting imitations instead of what God truly has for you so I'm going to pray for you right now father God I thank you you are a good good God and you give good good things to your children and father we do not want to have anything less than your best God we acknowledge there are so many areas in life where we have been distracted from you where our eyes have come off the ball because we, we feel like we've been offered so many other things that are going to bring us fulfillment, that are going to bring us happiness and joy and contentment. And in reality, it's just the enemy copying things that you've done and giving us a less than version. 
God, we want our eyes to be truly on you. So help us right now to acknowledge what those things are. God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would be working in our hearts in each of our homes right now, opening our eyes and revealing where we have been seeking answers in the wrong place. God, if we've been looking for validation or for clarity or for making ourselves feel better in any areas other than the good gifts that you have for us, just expose that right now. Bring it to the light. Let us see what it is that we have been focusing on instead of you. And God, remind us of what your incredible promises are. Remind us of what it is that you have for us. And let us step into everything that you have. God, we thank you so much for the power that you give us. God, we thank you that you have made a way and bridged a gap for us to be with you, to walk with you, to know you, and to find ultimate fulfillment. And God, we pray that we would accept nothing less than what you have for us. And so we give it over to you this morning and we ask that your will be done in our lives as we walk with you and as we know you and as we truly accept everything that you have for us. In your name, Jesus. Amen.